Hello and welcome to Inside Exercise. I'm Emeritus Professor Glenn McConnell from Victoria University in Australia, and I'm also currently a Danish Diabetes and Endocrine Academy Visiting Professor at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. The idea behind Inside Exercise is to bring to you the absolute who's who of exercise research. So exercise physiology, exercise metabolism, and exercise and health. And what I'm really wanting is for you to get your exercise information from the research experts rather than from influencers. And indeed, today I bring to you Professor Shona Holson from the Australian Catholic University in Melbourne, Australia. She's an expert on sleep, recovery, and fatigue in athletes. So we talked about how much sleep do athletes have and how much sleep do athletes need, the effect of insufficient sleep on exercise performance, and also the effect of sleep on recovery and fatigue. She said that um, sleep is sort of the cornerstone. You need to have sufficient sleep. You need to have good um, nutrition, et cetera. And then the other things that maybe just are icing on the cake. So things like ice baths, contrast baths, compression garments may have some small effects, but the most important thing is to get your sleep and your nutrition in order. With recovery, we talked about physical recovery, but also mental, so mental fatigue, et cetera. I found it really interesting. I think you will too, so stick around. Also, if you can do me a favor, please um, like, subscribe, uh, comment, et cetera, because the uh, algorithm tends to like that, so it tends to pop up more when people do searches, et cetera. And you will note that I have timestamps below, so if you're on YouTube, you can actually click on the times and it will take you straight to that point. Uh, and then on other programs like Spotify and Apple Podcasts, et cetera, you can see the timestamps, but you just sort of take note of what's uh, taking place at that time. But I would, of course, prefer for you to watch the whole thing because then you'll get a better understanding of the whole area. So anyway, stick around. And I'm sure you'll enjoy this one. Hi, Shana. How are you? Welcome to Inside Exercise. Yeah, I'm great. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks for having me on. No, my pleasure. Okay, so we're going to be talking about sleep. Uh, recovery, fatigue, and, and athletes, and sports in particular. Um, but I, all I'd like to do at the start is just sort of ask about you. So how did you get into sports, sort of exercise research? Or were, you a, were you a sports person to start with, or did you get into to, um, science and think, oh, I, want to, I might start looking at sports? Yeah, good question. I was very interested in science, but also um, was probably a quite your typical sports scientist that liked sport to mm -hmm. participate in, but wasn't quite good enough, right? So um, got to combine my love of exercise and science um, in, in the one thing. So, Okay. So so where did you start off? And, um, and why don't you just tell people a little bit about where you are now? Yeah, so I started, I did my undergraduate um, course at QUT in Brisbane and did my PhD through there as well as Birmingham University um, in the UK and then headed straight out to the Australian Institute of Sport. So I worked there as the head of recovery for nearly 16 years. Um, then in 2018, transitioned uh, across to academia and have been at ACU uh, since then. Right, okay. So... What I would like, like to do also is just clarify in people's heads, uh, like we did before we started. Yeah, what are we talking about? So sleep's easy. I think we all understand mm -hmm. sleep. Okay. Um, but then with recovery and fatigue. So, you know, are we talking about recovery from each bout or more sort of chronic? And then fatigue, I guess we're not talking about, you know, I had a Harkin Western blad on talking about, you know, what's causing fatigue in your muscles during exercise, calcium release and all this sort of stuff. I guess we're talking about more sort of ongoing. Do you want to just sort of explain what you're talking about there with that? Yeah. So I guess my approach to recovery and where we've done most of the research has initially been from a real practical perspective. So, you know, working with athletes, what can they do from a day-to-day -day basis to either train better next time they train or to perform better if they're in a performance setting. So from a recovery perspective, we've looked at a lot of like physical recovery strategies like water immersion and ice baths and, and um, different types of compression and those, those sorts of things. So we've looked at really physical recovery strategies and how to, um, how to sort of match that to the fatigue that's induced. So we have explored a little bit around different types of exercise and what sorts of recovery strategies um, might be best. Um, but then always thinking of sleep as like the best recovery strategy that we have. Um, and so, you know, sleep and nutrition being really the foundations of those um, recovery strategies, strategies for exercise for athletes post-exercise. Okay. So um, we won't be talking so much about the nutrition. So an obvious thing people think about, okay, after exercise, how am I going to recover for the next bout? maybe high carbohydrate diets and, you know, 
um, get, make sure I'm hydrated. We won't be talking about those things. It's more like we're kind of assuming people are doing that. Is that right? And then it's sort of icy on the cake maybe. Yeah, and I guess we, um, you, you know, when the work that we've done, especially when I was at the Institute of Sport, you know, we had the nutrition department. We had Louise Burke, right, you know, leading the way. Um, and so there was, you know, we've sort of seen that there's a lot of good nutrition research from a recovery perspective done over the years. Um, and so knowing that nutrition is absolutely one of the foundations and fundamental aspects of recovery, um, the approach that that we looked at was some of the more physical um, and applied strategies mm. that athletes could use day to day. All right. So we start off thinking about sleep, as you said, that's sort of the, the cornerstone. And if you, I guess if you're not sleeping enough, the rest of it uh, maybe not be as much as, as important. Can we just think about how much sleep do people need? Because I know if we think about if you're not a sports person, they tend to talk about this inverted you or whatever mm -hmm. that, you know, if you mm -hmm. don't have enough sleep and then even if you have too much and like seven hours is sort of like the cutoff. I guess it depends on the sport. It depends. Um, so why don't you tell us? How much do people actually need? Do they need more for a sports person than a non-sports person, for example? Mm, yeah, it's a great question. I think what we think with athletes, we don't know, but we think that because, you know, sleep really serves to repair the body and the brain from the previous day, right? And so we think that athletes probably need more physical um, recovery. So probably needing, you know, sleep probably um, helps in that space in terms of getting more physical recovery. Um, but in terms of what an athlete needs, I think, yes, an athlete probably needs more than someone who's not exercising as much. But then within athletes, it's highly variable. Um, mm. And so we do know now there's quite a, a strong genetic component to sleep. And, and, you know, you see it sometimes with athletes and you see some are quite short duration, but their quality is really good. Or there's other times mm. where you see people, they sleep, they sleep long, but they probably need to. Um, because their quality is quite poor. And so what we try to do is, you know, encourage athletes to um, to sort of think about what the amount of sleep they need to feel like they function best and to aim for that amount. And for one athlete, it might be seven. For another, it might be nine, nine to ten. Um, you may have seen we did a, a published a paper a couple of years ago and the, the title was how much sleep does an elite athlete need and and what mm. we did was we just asked them you know how much sleep do you feel like you need to be able to you know to feel refreshed and, and to do what you need to do um, and then we actually measured the sleep in these athletes and, and found that on average athletes were getting about 95 minutes less sleep per night than they felt they actually needed. So um, I think there's, there's the amount that people need and then there's the amount that people get um, mm. and, and partly, um, you know, contributed, you know, by the fact that there's lots of things that can get in the way of someone's sleep. Um, plenty of things that we can maybe talk about at some point, but there's lots yeah. of things that can get in the way. So, so how do, how do, um, I mean, it seems sort of obvious. You just think, oh yeah, I feel tired. So, and if I have this much sleep, I don't feel tired. So this is how much I need. But, um, is there a way of like measuring that? Like, is there yeah. a way of actually measuring like, oh, you, you've, you're getting too much, not enough. Or is it just obviously you've, you're falling asleep while you're, you're working or you can't get to sleep because you're not tired? Yeah, we tend to ask for get them to think about three key questions. Uh, we tend to ask how you feel within an hour of waking up. So you should feel relatively, no one feels perfect as soon as they wake <laughs> up, right? But within an hour, you should feel pretty good. You should be able to get through the day without needing a nap. Um, so you mm -hmm. should be able to, you know, get through to your normal bedtime. And then you should fall asleep in a reasonable amount of time. So at night. So if you put your head on mm -hmm. the pillow and you're gone in zero minutes, you're completely asleep. It's probably a sign that you're um, a little sleep deprived. Now, what do you remember what the numbers were? So, so how many hours do they feel like they need and uh, how many hours do they get? Yeah. It's obviously whatever you said, 75 minutes less. Yeah. And then do you know how that compares to if you asked a non-athlete? Again, it's it's so variable because because mm. some athletes, you know, it's so different how much energy they're going through, how much um, I don't know, mental focus they have, whatever that they need for their sport. Do you know is there like a difference? So if you ask someone who's a non-athlete, they say seven hours, you ask an athlete, they say eight and a half. Yeah, I'm, I haven't seen anything that's looked at the difference between elite athletes and, and non-athletes. We do see in general, though, that athletes sleep less in terms of duration and quality than the general population. So they actually get less. less. 
Yes, even though really? we and we've shown that in um, in our athletes and um, the UK, some um, a group from the UK have, have shown something similar as well. So um, you would think that with the requirement for more sleep being there for an athlete, that they'd get more. And you know, you see athletes tired all the time, right? And the question is, mm-hmm. are they fatigued from training and they fatigued from not sleeping enough? Um, but generally, athletes could get um, could get more sleep, and we're starting to understand now some of the reasons why. Um, athletes might find it challenging to um, to to get the sleep that they need. Wow! So they actually sleep less. Because again, I've got the seven hours in my head at one stage. Because mm-hmm. I always thought it'd be eight for some reason. I think they said seven was sort of like you know, and then less was not good. And then if you have like ten or whatever, that's not necessarily good mm-hmm. either. Mm-hmm. But whatever it is, they're actually sleeping less than that, even though they're doing all this extra. Demands sleeping, mentally sleeping, and physically in some ways. Yeah, sleeping less than the general population. And we know the general population don't sleep well either. So um yeah, athletes, the, oh. the data that's that's out there suggests that they that they're actually sleeping less. Okay. But they tend to do well, obviously. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> well, it's weird. Yeah. I wonder if we've somehow got it back to front. You know what I mean? Like it, just intuitively. I wonder if there's somehow, this is kind of weird, but you know. Because how does it work out that way? You know what I mean? Like I know, okay, you say so you'll say they're stressed and they can't sleep well, or maybe they're traveling or whatever. But if they end up being so good and they don't sleep very much, I wonder if somehow uh, exercise is sort of having some sort of brain, you know, calming effect or some bloody weird yeah. thing. I would think that based on the sleep extension work that's been done in athletes, um, that if they got more, they'd be better. Um, so the well, data, that was the next question. Yeah. yeah. So uh-huh. the data suggests that if you, and when I look at these sleep extension studies in athletes where they get an extra hour and a half, I think they're just bringing them back to normal, right? So they're not really right. true sleep extension. Well, they are sleep extension because they're mm-hmm. the, the athletes are getting more sleep than they were. Um, but in reality, they're probably being just more like, um, okay. know, more like the general population or more well, like they should be getting. Well, that's what I was going to ask you before I said the last strange bit. It's going to say, yeah, if they if they get if you get them to sleep bit longer, do they do better? So they do better uh, performance wise, or yeah. So um, the, the and there's not much work in this space. Most of the research is done on sleep deprivation. So you look at all the effects, you know, the negative effects of sleep deprivation, and we've seen that quite consistently. Uh, the thing that we don't have as much research on, but the research that is there suggests that yes, if um, athletes um, get more sleep, so they, their sleep is extended over a, a reasonable amount of time, like you probably need at least five days. Um, then you will see performance effects, mood effects, um, effects on cognitive function. Um, it's all it's 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 quite consistent in those small number of studies that have done it. Okay, well, it makes it makes sense, right? I was just I was just trying to think of it. If it was so widespread, you wonder if it's somehow you know like designed that way. But yeah, if yeah. if you're saying that when you do longer, they do better, then then that makes sense. Yeah. What I'm about different? Because I. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. the only thing I was going to say is we're just talking, I guess, about nighttime sleep. Athletes nap. Um, they nap a lot. Um, and so mm-hmm. they're probably, they've got less. If you look at over a 24-hour period, athletes are probably getting the same, if not more sleep than some people um, because they need to top up um, with their oh, naps during okay. the day. Yeah. So we've done a oh, bit sorry, of work I was talking about as well. So, yeah. I thought the whole time we were talking about total sleep. Okay. So let's step back a little bit. So if we're talking about the sleep over the whole day, yes, athletes so aren't hours. sleeping less than um... we don't. We think that's probably closer to the general population. If you just okay, most well, of the studies sense. though, and the challenge is, it's really hard to measure naps accurately. Really hard. Mm-hmm. Um, and so um, even, but what we what we do see is that somewhere between twenty to ninety minutes during the day is about right. Um, to top up so it really depends on like how how sleep deprived you are um, will have a relationship to how much sleep you will need during your nap Um, but if you look at nighttime sleep in athletes they tend to get less and that's because we get them Uh, early for training and all those kinds of mm -hmm. things Um, and the reason um, that they have to nap is because their sleep during the night is shorter but a lot of athletes during the day can't nap so that makes it um, that makes it a challenge Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. The whole time we were talking, I was thinking total sleep. So you think total, just to summarize, just, are you thinking generally uh, across the whole day? Cause I, I know obviously it's important if it's night during the day, yeah, right? Yeah. If we say they're sleeping less, I'm assuming during the whole day, um, they sleep about the same. Yeah. Probably on average. 
but not Ma- more. And you'd mm. think that they would probably exercise, uh, sleep more. Yeah, so, I would say it wouldn't summarize. be more. Yeah, it wouldn't be more than the mm. general population, but we really don't have good napping data in the general mm. population in athletes. We think All that right. athletes are doing it just to top up because they're, they're absolutely not, not getting enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then when we talk about athletes, again, it's a broad topic. So what about if, you know, if it's endurance versus strength versus, because I, I obviously a lot, and I know you've done research on this, is training load, you know, a lot of mm-hmm, effective mm-hmm. training load, you know, and then getting fatigued if, you, if training load's too high, et cetera. Does training load uh, physically or, or even mentally affect how much sleep someone needs? So, you know, if you're training like crazy, but you don't have to, like if you're a cyclist cycling six hours a day, but it's just turning the pedals and there isn't meant, I don't want to put down cyclists, trust me. It's the main thing I do nowadays. Um, you know, you don't have to think about it, but if it's something where it's really technical, you know, and you've got to think and you're a decathlete and you've got 10 different events to think about mm-hmm, or something, mm-hmm. does that, do you know if that affects how much sleep they need? The sort of the, the physical load, the mental load? Yeah, we think, we think it does. Um, and so when we have done some work looking at mental recovery and mental fatigue, and that mental fatigue seems to be really closely related to sleep. So there definitely seems to be some some strong um, relationship there. Um, but a lot of the work, so if you look at sleep over, uh, you know, over overnight and you look at architecture and you look at REM sleep and you look at non-REM sleep, you know, there's the general theory is that they serve different functions and that depending on where you are in sleep, you're prioritizing brain restoration or you're recovering, you know, physically. Um, And so if you just really need a big lot of physical recovery, you might be, you know, getting a little bit more deep sleep um, because that's what your body's prioritizing. Um, Or if you really need to, you know, repair the cognitive, you you know, your brain from, from, you know, a lot of um, cognitive fatigue, then you may have a different stage of sleep. You might get a little bit more REM to try and recover um, your your brain sleep. But what we do know um, is that um, there's been a couple of studies done. We've been involved in these as well. If you're training really hard, like you're in the almost overreaching kind of state, like you're really doing intensified training, you're quite likely to have disturbed sleep. Again, Mm -hmm. doesn't make that sense, you know, in terms of what you actually need, but it's almost like a fight or flight kind of response where um, the, the, the body's not getting the sleep at, and the brain is not getting the sleep that it's required because you've got these super high stressful um, training loads. Okay. And then they sleep less. Sleep less. A- is disturbed. it just less or is it also the, like you said, the architecture, the, the yeah. RAM versus? Yeah. It seems to be more disturbed. So less quality sleep with really high, um, really high training loads. Okay. And just to clarify, so when you say the quality, because I'm not too good on the the REM versus the, the deep mm-hmm. and whatever, when you talk about quality of sleep, so just say someone's same person sleeping seven hours and then the next day they sleep seven hours, but the quality is not as good. Mm-hmm. What does that actually mean? I would say the simplest way to, um, to explain that is they're getting um, the higher quality sleep someone has, the less lighter sleep that they're having. Um, so they're in those less light that because you've got multiple stages um, of sleep um, and there's mm-hmm. some that are considered really light and they're not as restorative for the body or for the brain. So you're probably getting more light sleep. You're probably waking up a little bit more. Um, mm-hmm. And so you probably just generally have more disturbed sleep when you've got lighter okay. or lower quality. And and you're saying the REM tends to be more uh, sort of brain recovery and the deeper sleep is more the physical is that, yeah, is that right? it's a, it's a quite a generalization, but that's mm-hmm. really the way that um, that sleep is viewed at the moment. Okay, and do you find that the people that need the more, I'm I'm getting a bit nitty gritty, but I'm just finding it interesting. Do we find the people that need more mental, um, you know, activities related to the exercise? Do they tend to have more the sort of the the REM and the, the people that really just grinding away for hours and hours and hours they tend to have more of the deep is it is that too simple um we don't know and one of the challenges is um because measuring brain activity during sleep is not easy um so in previously you know the only way to do it is to put people in a sleep laboratory um, which is really expensive and artificial and can't get athletes in there right um now we're starting to have more sort of portable uh, equipment that can be done at home like single channel EEGs so um, now we're 
able to do more home environment type studies, which opens us up to be able to explore um, these kinds of measures in elite athletes, which it's almost impossible to get a, you know, an elite athlete in a sleep lab for a few nights where they, mm. you know, they're not allowed out. Um, so we start, we will have answers to those questions as we get more uh, sort of applied technology that athletes can use at, in home or when they're training or in training camps and those kinds of things. Okay. And, and when we talk about uh, sleep affecting before, I guess we haven't really talked specifically about performance. Um, how, how much, okay. So if you have one bad night, cause I remember when I was a distance runner, it was almost like normal just to have a crappy night's mm-hmm. sleep. Mm-hmm before a big race and, and I didn't feel like it affected me mm-hmm. just one night. So when you're talking about exercise as sleep and, and exercise performance, is it usually like, is it one night is not a problem, but if it's, you know, is it, do you know that it's like one night a problem because it didn't seem to be, but if yeah. you had a few nights in a row, you'd be like, crap, I don't feel like running. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Right. So the data seems to suggest somewhere between three to five days as a minimum of reduced sleep. So deprived sleep. So we're talking Mm -hmm. probably two or three hours less than you'd get normally between three to five days and you'll start to see a performance effect. But the interesting thing is the the science shows that if if the physiology doesn't change, right, it's not like all of a sudden your VO2 max just drops ridiculously. It's your perception of effort raises. Mm, Um, So everything, and we all know what it feels like, right? Everything feels hard and uncomfortable. And, um, and that tends to be, especially when you're in, you're in a lab, right? And you're trying to get people to go as hard as they can when they're sleep deprived. You know, Mm. it's, it's all around perception of effort that we think is, is the real key to why people's performances will drop. But yes, you, and, and it's the real, it's a balance when I'm talking to athletes, it's like, we don't, we want you to pay attention to your sleep and we want you to be a good, consistent sleeper as often as you can. But if it's the night before an Olympic final and you get a bad night in the village, which you probably will, you're, Mm. you're going to be fine. 20 years of training doesn't disappear. You might feel a bit ordinary but you get to the start line you can't tell me the adrenaline and probably caffeine is not going to you know solve some of your um your perception of effort issues exactly so the motivation will be so high um i saw you had a paper first author 2022 so i think it ties into what we're talking about here sleep regularity and predictors Mm -hmm. of sleep efficiency and sleep duration Mm -hmm. in elite team sport athletes do you want to just tell us a little bit about what you're doing that one so there's a real interest in non-athletes. It's, it's been in the sleep world for a little while about how important consistency of sleep is. Bedtime, wake time, as consistent as possible. We know that shift workers have really you know poor sleep because of the lack of consistency. Um, and so we had this opportunity to, like during COVID, you know, when you can't actually test real people. So you, you, look, you go, oh, I've, got, I've got massive amounts of sleep data from really good athletes. How about we just try and explore it and see what we can find? Um, so what we did and to explore this idea about regularity of sleep. And so essentially what we found is those um, athletes who are more regular, so consistency in bed and wake time had better quality of sleep. So they didn't sleep longer but their quality of sleep was better. And interestingly, in just in the last couple of months, there's been some big um, uh, papers published out of Monash using the UK Biobank data on sleep. And they're showing that, again, it's probably more important to be consistent in your sleep um, rather, so, rather than duration. So consistency is probably more important. And often for a lot of people, consistency you can kind of control. Like maybe you have to get up early all the time, but you can potentially control your consistency. Um, And a lot of athletes might not have a whole lot of control over the actual duration that that, that they're able to get. So being consistent now, and I think I look at, you know, analyzed so many athletes sleep over the years and you get the diary and you get the sleep watch. And sometimes I think I just need to look at the diary and I can look at their bed and wake times. And I got a pretty good idea of how messy their sleep is going to be based on how consistent they are or not. That's interesting. So it comes about down to sort of circadian rhythm, not messing around with your yes. timing. Yeah. I just, I just explain it to athletes. Like, you know, we need to, you know, the body likes to know, um, you know, what, you know, what it's going to expect. Like an ex- expectation is, you know, if you're, if you're bed at 10 and awake at seven, you want to do that regularly. And, and I often say to athletes, it's not, if you're going to bed at 10 PM one night, 
and then 1 a.m. in the morning the next, like that's no different technically speaking, to like travelling across to Perth where we've got a three-hour time zone d- d- change, right? Mm. So why would you do that? I mean, it is a little bit different when you look at jet lag and circadian rhythms, but why would you mess up um, your consistency if you don't have to? And some athletes have to, like you look at football players playing night matches or, you know, you can't, if you're an NBA player, you know, your schedule is going to be all over the place. But for many, you know, regular exercises, you can have, you know, some reasonable control over your consistency. And I think that's one of the things that the message that hasn't quite got across in the sleep world yet is how important um, consistency is. And I'm assuming you controlled for, because naturally if you go to bed normally at 10 and get up at seven, for example, uh, actually it's pretty nice. It's nine hours. Yeah, um, be great. Or just say, if you go to bed at 11 and get up at seven, yeah. it's probably more likely it's eight hours. And then you say they go to bed at one, I'm assuming you control for the fact that it's not that they're getting up at seven. So it wasn't, it wasn't just that they were sleeping less, even if they have the same amount of sleep, going yes. to bed at different times messes things up. Messes, is that right? Yes. Yes, it does. Yeah. And the thing that we do see though, is most people have more control over their bedtime than their wake time. Especially if you're an athlete, you've got to be at a, you know, you're exactly. training at a certain time. Mm-hmm. So what people mess up is their bedtime. Um, and mm-hmm. so that's why we encourage people to, because normally if you go to bed at 1am and that's like three hours later than you'd normally sleep, you normally wouldn't get that extra three hours. Exactly. So that's why I was wondering if you, you know, control for that, because how do you do yeah. that? But you did. So yes. maybe they did instead of 11 till seven, they do uh, one till seven and then have a nap later or something. Yeah. You know, and, and So it ends up the same. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, it doesn't, you know, people always say, you know, that old adage is it, you know, are the hours after midnight more important than the hours before midnight? And that's not really the case. The, the, the issue is that if you go to bed after midnight, you're likely just not to get the duration of sleep that you need because we all have life and we all have things we need to do or, you know, in Australia mm-hmm. at the moment, the sun's up pretty early. Um, and yeah. so you just naturally get up or you've got things to do or you're used to getting up at a certain time. And so going to bed later just means you just truncate your sleep. All right. your but even if you short. do sleep the same, you won't be as, things won't be as good. Yeah. If, if you're consistently doing this, even if it's the same mm-hmm. duration. Yeah. I always think, I always think, um, cause it's not that long ago, you know, in, in evolutionary terms, since we were like cave, cave people, can't go cave men anymore. Um, or, or even just we didn't have light, right? So obviously mm-hmm. you would go, it would get dark and you'd go to bed. It would mm-hmm. get light and you'd wake up, mm-hmm. uh, you know, mm-hmm. and that, that's just sort of normal. But now we've got all this, you know, blue light and all, all these lights and things, and we have the option of staying up. You, you wouldn't be staying up to one in the morning if you didn't have any light. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and that's so. where, you know, some of the research is really interesting because they're looking at split sleep, which is, I think, what used to happen you know, back when, you know, we didn't have artificial light because it would get dark so you'd go to bed, but then you'd wake up Mm. in the middle of the night and then you'd go back again to sleep because you've gone to bed so early because the sun's gone down, right? So that's that's where that kind of split Mm. sleep sort of came from. Um, but then also we see, you know, big differences depending on, you know, summer and winter and, and kind exactly. of where you are in the world. I was thinking, because we're in Denmark here, right? I, when I yeah. come, so my fourth visit, we always come for summer. So I feel a bit bad, actually, because I, I was saying to my collaborator yesterday, we sort of, you know, leave the sinking ship because we come, you know, when it's nice and when it's getting dark mm. and kind of crappy, we take off. Yeah. If we, you know, if you love Copenhagen so much, why don't you come in winter? But <laughs> um yeah, so literally the difference, it gets uh, in winter, it's like four hours a night. So you can't even say, oh, you go to bed mm. when it's dark and get up when it's light because that would be, you know, it's four hours at one end and it's 15 hours at the other. So, yeah. Yes. yeah. Okay. So just again to sleep and performance, do we know how, so you said you need three or four day, days. Again, I, I just like, I, I keep thinking we're saying athletes, athletes, athletes. Mm-hmm. Is there a difference? Maybe we don't, you don't really know that, you know, three or four hours uh, three or four days of not sleeping enough, how much does it actually affect performance? And does it affect things where you need to sort of concentrate or whatever more than things we just have to grind it out? Do it? Do you know that? Yeah, it does. That does seem to be the case. But the thing that seems to be a little bit more important than that is the duration of the task, right? So if you okay. ask someone to do a counter movement jump and you just ask them to do, you know, a one-off max jump or, you know, even a 30 second, you know, wind gate test or something really short, Often it's okay, you know, people can cope with that. 
ask them to do, you know, a one hour time trial or a team sport where they've, you know, obviously got to interact with other teammates and there's a lot more cognitive function, that's where you start to see the effects. So you need the kind of longer duration to be able to have the, um, the fatigue sort of show itself. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, now you had this one I, I've written here somewhere on my notes, sleep or swim, early morning training severely restricts the amount of sleep. So I guess we touched on that. But it just reminds me a couple of times I've seen on Twitter people saying, uh, should I should I miss my exercise tomorrow if I can't sleep four hours? Or should I do the I can only sleep four hours? Or should I do the exercise? You know, and then people say people have strong views. Oh no, no, you've got to do the exercise. Someone else said, No, no, you've got to do the sleep. I mean, I don't, I don't know. And no, I guess it depends. But do you have like a if someone says, I'm only gonna have four hours tonight should i exercise tomorrow or take the day off you know in terms of recovery mm. so we're heading towards mm. recovery fatigue yeah. is, there, is there an easy answer to that yeah i just i don't and this is just me this is things that i've i think i don't know if there's any data to support my theory here but i think if you're getting less than six hours of sleep in that night in the night then you know that's a concern and i'd be prioritizing sleep um, if I'm at risk of getting less than six hours. And the hope is that you're not getting less than six hours all the time, right? So my thought would be that, because, I mean, sleep, we know it's, I mean, we know how valuable exercise is, right, 100%. But we also know a lot of data how important sleep is for overall health, but not just for that, but for functioning the next day, for our reaction time, for our ability to be efficient at work, to not have injuries in terms of accidents and mode, you know, you know, the data is so strong that when we see when daylight saving shifts and it's only one hour less of sleep, the number of accidents increase. Mm -hmm. So for me, mm -hmm. if I'm not an elite, an elite athlete, you know, trying to get to the Paris Olympics, which I'm not, um, then I'd be mm -hmm. prioritizing sleep, not every night, but as often as possible, I'd be making sure that I'm at least getting my six to seven and then trying to squeeze some um, some exercise in there as well. And I'm sure exercise people will completely disagree with me, but I think, um, you know, sleep is so foundational to our health okay. that we shouldn't let it go too often. So would you even go as far as if you're not training for the Paris Olympics? Well, I guess it's a question is if you are or not. Um, and you literally knew you were going to have four hours sleep or you had four hours sleep. Mm -hmm. And it was just a training session, you know, not mm -hmm. not a race, you know, because we yeah. already said you can you can have four hours and do great in the race. Mm -hmm. You've had four hours sleep. Would you say skip that session, or or would you do it easy, or what would you do? Yeah, if you'd already gotten the four hours and that's all you and and you're awake and you're you're good to go, then I'd still do the exercise. It's just what I'm thinking is I wouldn't set my alarm to get up early to exercise if I've gone to bed no, no, to. No, no one or two in the morning but if, if you're awake I'd still do the exercise I'd still do the exercise during the day um, and maybe try and find if you've got time to exercise you might have time to do a little bit of a nap have a little bit of a nap as well all right and would you go because I know I've done that so if I've had really bad sleep and I just felt crappy I think mm. oh you know what I'm just gonna have an easy day you know maybe mm. I was planning on doing intervals or something I'd say mm. make it an easy day today is, is that like part of it just makes logical sense you know if, if your yeah. body's telling you you know what just have an easy day or your brain is <laughs> Yeah, it's maybe probably, listen yeah, to it. Yeah, I think um, it's probably that lack of that lack of motivation. But for me, I'm just if I'm really sleep deprived, like if I've been traveling and I'm jet lagged, I tend to do slightly. I can I feel like I can still push myself reasonably hard, but I'm careful about what I do. Like it might be on a stationary bike, right, rather than you know doing box jumps off something where I might you know hurt mm. myself. So I think, okay, okay, I'm just going to play it safe because, and maybe that's me knowing the relationship between injury and sleep, but I know I'm more likely to probably fall over or do something silly. Um, I And it is harder to get, I think it's harder to get the motivation to turn up. But then I think once you turn up, you kind of just, I kind of find it, you, okay. know, you can push through, but being careful maybe about what you're actually doing if you've got a choice over what you're doing. Another thing is, this, this might be just my weird thing, is when I have like four hours of sleep or something, sometimes I actually feel a bit up. Have you seen that with people? Yeah. Like when they do sleep studies, I feel like a bit up, like kind of like, you know, yeah, a bit it's a bit of like manic a, or something. Yeah. So it was almost like a bit of euphoria. Yeah. It, and it mm. sometimes, I, and I find that actually when I'm also a bit jet lagged, I find I go through ups, highs and lows. And, um, but yeah, I think I, people do talk about that. Um, it's probably just a way of the brain kind of going, you got to get through this. So <laughs> trying to make you feel good. <laughs> 
Yeah, now I can't help thinking as also when we're talking about early in the morning and people feel, feeling tired and things, I don't actually drink tea or coffee. I'm a bit of a strange one. Mm. So I, and I actually saw you had something on a meta-analysis on caffeine mm. and sleep. So I wonder how much that sort of makes things hard to study because, you know, if these people, people are having caffeine, which is a stimulant, mm. and they're probably having more if they're tired, do you mm-hmm. control, when you in your studies, do you try and, and I guess mm. if you did control that, if you took away the caffeine when they normally drink it, then that's a problem as well. Like, how do you actually look yes. at that? This was a conversation we had about 12 months ago with a range of people because we're actually, so yes, the meta-analysis, we looked at existing studies um, that had looked at different doses and different timing of caffeine and then look and, and sleep. And so we, we we did those calculations and we got some data and some cutoffs, but then we wanted to do the, the study ourselves, right? So um, we wanted to look at different doses and different timing of caffeine consumption on sleep. But the question is then, as exactly as you say, if you take if you take the caffeine away, they're probably going to have a negative response, um, but you've got to control for it. So what we did was we chose people who were not really high caffeine intake people. Um, we had them around the, between 100 and 300 milligrams a day. We gave them their habitual dose at the start in the morning so that they were just in capsule form. And then we gave them their cafe, the, the actual intervention throughout the day. Because, yeah, it is a really you get criticized either way. You know, if you give caffeine, you don't control it or you do, or you take it away. um, It's a bit of a challenge. Mm. So we provided them with their habitual dose in the morning. And I guess when people do have, you know, so, so you're doing a study, but I'm Mm -hmm. thinking about just in real life, I guess when Mm -hmm. people do have less sleep and, and, and you're saying, well, it doesn't really affect their performance the next day or two, or, you know, if they have a couple of days, I guess they're having more caffeine, Caffeine. uh, coffee, right? Um, I would suggest they are. When I've looked at, again, athletes' sleep diaries where we ask them to record a lot of things and record caffeine intake, you certainly see it, you know, it's post-travel. Um, we, we did some work with a, an NFL team in, in the States and um, they, you know, they're at the club really early and they go home really late because they're and they're in small rooms like looking at learning play and watching video in dark rooms and there is some serious caffeine intake in those guys to get through the day um, and of course that's more than likely going to have ramifications for the nighttime sleep and then they get to the club the next day and they've got to just keep pumping the caffeine in because it becomes a, a, a bit of a cycle of lots of caffeine poor sleep need more caffeine so do we know this is a bit off to the side a bit but do we know what time because it seems to get early and early and earlier do you do you know you know just generally what time they're saying now like it's like two in the afternoon or something yeah the, the our meta-analysis was a bit was about 112 in the afternoon for a cutoff for a, a hundred milligrams so I was 112 yeah 112 oh, so the, you see people are going to be cranking it at 1 a 1 p.m i know we yeah. all talk about it at work it's 112 um but yeah. the, that was just for a standard cup of coffee if you look at some of if you looked at the data for some of these um pre-workout supplements that have really high levels of of caffeine in them uh the cutoff time was um before 10 o'clock in the morning shouldn't be consumed because um, that will have wow. an effect on sleep at night. And we know athletes are using, you know, and general population are using pre-workouts in the afternoon. So the pre-workouts are uh, caffeine, a drink, I don't even know, to be honest, drinks that have caffeine or just other bits and pieces in them as well. Yeah, that's a good question. There's probably a lot of bits and pieces, but a lot of the pre-workouts, are they have a focus on caffeine. Um, and so the idea is that you've, you know, got this big stimulant hit and you can, you know, really go hard in your mm-hmm. afternoon training mm-hmm. sessions. And um, yeah, some of them, you know, they think um, athletes go, oh, this is working really well for me um, and they're training well. And then you look at the, um, and you look at the amount of caffeine and you, know, you, you they have to have um, implications for the nighttime sleep. So it is that balance and we, and especially athletes that want to take caffeine for performance. Like if you're, you know, an elite athlete and you're performing at night, I'm like, you do what you got to do to play well, like, and to, and to, you know, we want you to win. We want, we want you to be good sleepers, but we really want you to win. Right. Um, And so if you need to take caffeine to feel like you are going to perform at your best, that's okay, but use it strategically. Don't use more than you actually really need. And if there's times that you don't need it, don't use it. Um, but understand that if you're going to take it in the evening, there's a there's a risk that you're going to have um, poor sleep that night. Yeah, and way way back, and I did my masters with David Costa at Ball State in Indiana from '89 to '91. We actually did a study there, and it was interesting because I don't I don't have tea, drink tea or coffee, yeah. right? 
but they looked at responders and non-responders and I was actually a non-responder. So when they gave me a, a whack of caffeine, my yeah. blood pressure didn't go up. My heart rate didn't go up. But, um, and then they had another guy who was just famous for like making these really strong, you know, this big macho thing every morning who can make the strongest coffee and his went through the roof. So, you know, his blood pressure and things. So even though he had a lot, so it's like that you have responders and non-responders, mm. but then, but then at the same time, you can actually habituate to caffeine yes. and you need more and more. Mm-hmm. So do you actually find that much in your studies that, um, I don't know, yeah. I don't actually know what I'm saying. So the mm-hmm. people that like maybe are not really respond much, like yeah. they really crank it. and yeah. yeah. What we have recent just looked at and it's very fresh data. So I'm, you know, saying this with a grain of salt right now because we haven't done the stats and done things on it. But with this caffeine study that um, one of the PhD students is at ACU is doing, we gave the different doses. We also um, looked at the genotype, um, genotyping for, for, for caffeine. Um, we looked at metabolism and sensitivity. And because we, you know, probably at this point, because of the large variation, we're probably a bit underpowered to see anything in terms of the actual um, genotyping, but there definitely looks like if you're someone who's a slow metabolizer and you're sensitive mm-hmm. to caffeine, um, you will have um, a bigger influence on your sleep than someone who metabolizes it fast and isn't sensitive mm. to it. So okay. we're starting to That's explore that space a little bit more, but then it's hard because, I mean, you probably know yourself, you can, you, people, you know, I think, um, I always thought I was a relatively sensitive person to caffeine. And when I did my genotyping, yep, yeah, I actually am. Um, so maybe mm. we don't need to genotype. Maybe people kind of know um, just off experience. Okay. Well, it's funny. I, I sometimes think I'm all high and mighty. I don't have to line up, you know, for coffee and things to feel okay. But I crank a lot of um, chocolate. <laughs> I'm a bad man for chocolate that has caffeine in it. Yeah, now, just talking about genotyping and things, it's actually good because the next thing on my list was here, um, Malcolm from Twitter. Is there a genetic? No, it's genetic. Is there a genetic link to how much sleep an individual needs? Uh, how much sleep is too much? Negatives of too much sleep. Mm-hmm. I guess we mm-hmm. haven't really talked. So mm-hmm. I guess there is a genetic link. I think you may have mentioned it earlier. Yeah, yeah. So that's something that you know we can now you know look at circadian clock genes and all those kinds of things. You know, but we're starting to mm-hmm. think yes, there is a, a a link. And and it's interesting. You talk to people and you ask. You know especially if someone's a sleepwalker or they've got um, a clinical sleep issue, you can almost be guaranteed it's somewhere in the family. Um, but in terms of, you know, actual how much sleep you need, I think I think it will, we will find out in time that that's the case, that it is, it is definitely, um, it is definitely has, has a strong genetic link um, to, to, to your mm-hmm. sleep. So, um, and the and question it, around too much mm-hmm. sleep, I think that's a really interesting one because, a whole lot of there's been you know meta analyses and assessments of you know sleeping too long, but it seems like that when people sleep too long, it's because they've got an underlying issue as a, a, a health issue like or a mental health or... issue. Yeah, mm. yeah. Um, and so the body's sort of or the brain is um asking for more sleep, right? So it's is it I don't I find it very difficult to see how if you're just a naturally long sleeper or you're just someone that naturally gets really good sleep, that that can be bad for your mortality. I just can't understand how that could be. (laughs) But I think if you're someone who's sleeping long because that's in response to something that's negative, then yes, I can absolutely see how that could work. Okay, so we've talked a lot about sleep, but now I'm just thinking about um, recovery and things like that. Now, you touched earlier on uh, overtraining, overreaching. Do you want to just explain the differences between them and how they maybe affect recovery, et cetera? Mm. (laughs) That's such a good question, and you may or may not have seen it, but we recently published a paper where we actually tried to find the, the, uh, the research that actually has been done on overtrained athletes, and we found zero papers that meet the definition, right? So it's a bit of a mess in terms of what we know scientifically, but we think that we it's sort of on a continuum, right? So you've got training, you've got intensified training, you've got overreaching, and then you've got overtraining syndrome. And the difference between them is really, in the difference really between overreaching and overtraining is how long it takes you to recover. Mm. You're talking months, you know, from overtraining, you're talking weeks from, from overreaching, mm. but it's just a theory. No one's ever, you know, and, and I understand why it hasn't been done. You can't keep pushing people until you move them from overreaching to overtraining. And, you know, maybe mm. you've, you've long damaged them sort of long term. So I understand why the studies haven't been done. 
Um, but those differences between overreaching and, and overtraining technically from a definition is how long it takes you um, to recover from, um, from the decline in performance that you need to see. Oh, that's interesting because, yeah, that for a while there was all the rage, these studies of um, so-called overtraining. I'm saying so-called mm, based on what mm, you just said. Mm. You know, looking at um, immunoglobulins and the, and, the, and the saliva and all this sort of stuff, yeah. it sounds like almost that quite a lot of those were probably overreaching, right? The, and you know, they'd yeah. say, oh, if your heart rate's elevated or even if your heart rate's depressed. But you're saying, so I just clarify what you're saying again. Is that no one's really looked technically at overtraining because they didn't really know if it was overreaching or? Yeah. So what we see in the, the so there are definitely studies that I think are over, they've got overreached athletes and they call them overtraining because the problem mm. is, is overtraining is the process as well as the outcome, right? So people get confused. Like this is an overtraining study because I'm training people really hard. Mm -hmm. Like, no, mm -hmm. no, no, you're doing an intensified training, training that has by adding results. extra. Yes. And the result mm -hmm. of that is either overreaching or overtraining. The studies on overtraining have really gotten athletes in and tried to die and tried to look at diagnostic tests to prove that they're overtrained. Right. So how do we, or, or to try and understand the mechanism. So you've got athletes that come in and they say, look, I meet the definition because um, my performance has been down for several months. Um, my mood is disturbed and my, um, and, you know, I can't recover. My performance is down and, and the it all ticks the boxes of the definition. Mm -hmm. But the classic question is, well, have you measured anything underlying in these people? Have they got, you know, something post-viral? Right. Have they got cardiac issues? So that's the big, the big question is we've never taken anyone through the full continuum to know does overreaching actually end up resulting in overtraining and is the time course of recovery really what differentiates the two states right and i saw in 2004 you had uh, does overtraining exist hmm. so obviously you've said you've been thinking about that more recently and sorry if i hmm. haven't i haven't seen the paper <laughs> since then do you think overtraining actually oh it sounds like you do but hmm. do you think overtraining actually exists because as you, as you say when you when you add a bunch of training on top of what people normally do they normally get better i remember when i was at hmm. um well, you know, I've taken, I'm kind of emeritus professor at Victoria University, but when I was there, you know, like on the payroll, David Bishop wanted to, mm -hmm. to look at mitochondrial function. So David Bishop has been on the podcast and, and thought, okay, I'm going to overtrain people. Well, over, yep. what did you call it? Yeah, when intensively you intensively train them. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Intensively train people and then look at how it messes up their mitochondrial mm. function. Mm. And that just, they just got better. Yeah. And I remember because mm -hmm. it was this Cesare guy and it was just crazy. Mm -hmm. They were just throwing more and more, they were getting to do hit twice yep. a day. Yeah. And they just got better. Better. And, yep. and said, okay, well, so we do it longer. And and, and then they, I think they had to make them carbohydrate depleted. So give them low carbohydrate and train the crap out of them before yes. they actually started to blow up. Yeah. So, yeah, do, do, yeah. Yeah. You've nailed a couple of really important things there. It's really hard to, like, if you've got reasonably fit athletes, in our experience, they get better and better. If you've got not quite as fit, people as your participants then they can start to get fatigued but generally speaking most people just get better and um, get better and better and um, you almost have to add so I often think is it overtraining or under recovery so are, are they carbohydrate depleted is that's what mm. causing the issues are they not sleeping um, I think I if we've probably seen when I was at the institute I think we probably saw one or two athletes that I would think you are actually overtrained. You are the classical definition. We've had really good doctors come and explore every medical thing, mm -hmm. and we think you're overtrained. One was a shift worker, um, and mm. one was incredibly stressed, life event stress, and was just not sleeping. Right. So I was like, mm, maybe it's oh. like lack of sleep and under recovery, mm. because if you train, train, train well, um, the caveat to that is that when I was doing my intensified training overreaching studies in Birmingham um, I was looking at cyclists and there was um, another uh, PhD student looking at runners and all my cyclists finished and they they did the whole protocol the runners broke right they got injured um, mm. and the injuries were the way of saying hang on hold up stop exactly this is a little too mm. much so I think it does depend on that's what I was starting to think when you were saying that because I thought what probably happens is you get you break down right. physically yeah. You get injured before, but that's interesting. You're saying with cyclists where you don't tend to get injured as much as runners, obviously, 
you're saying if if you've got someone who's who's fit already, so a serious athlete, they can just keep adding on and adding on and adding on, and they will tend to not get overtrained. Is that right? With sufficient recovery, I would I would. Oh, sorry, add, yeah, add, and the carbohydrate and the sleep. Yes, yep. yeah. If they've got all the, and obviously there's a certain point, but you look at you know cyclists on training camps like pro cyclists. I mean they, and you look at the tour like you know they can just push themselves mm. to the extreme. But you've got to give periods of time. Like you can't just keep doing that, you know, forever. forever. You have to give periods of time for a taper, periods of time for some general recovery. You know, two to three weeks of pushing people or even up to four or five weeks of pushing people really hard, I think as long as they've got the daily recovery embedded and they know there's an end in sight and it's not going to keep going forever mm. in a day, then I think um, a lot of people will respond really well to that. Well, that's the thing, as you said, with the, with the Tour de France, for example, it's three weeks and if anything, they're stronger, not all of them, you know, obviously some are just yeah. hanging on for dear life. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, often you'll see the the winner, for example, will, will just split the, the final time mm-hmm. trial or something, mm-hmm. almost stronger than they were than they two were. weeks earlier, which is just mind boggling. Yeah. But again, Absolutely. you say it's probably a three week tour for a reason. If it was a four week tour, then Might maybe they'd start to, to fall apart. Mm, for sure. Okay. So with recovery, again, you t- talked about carbohydrate, which is important. Mm-hmm. Actually, when you said the carbohydrate with the runners versus, versus the cyclists, it reminded me of a classic study by David Costell. Again, he did he did carbohydrate. Uh, he looked at glycogen, so doing mm-hmm. repeated biopsies mm-hmm. over days of training mm-hmm. in cyclists versus runners. And the cyclists were able to, to resynthesize every day and just stay pretty yeah. normal. And the runners yeah. just sort of kept going down. And I think it was, and that's when they started thinking about the eccentric exercise, the muscle damage and affecting glycogen resynthesis. And we did a bunch of studies on that. So that's interesting. So yeah, it depends on the, depends on the sport. And then just to summarize again, you were saying you might be able to just, if you're really fit to start with, go nuts for a few weeks, but that's assuming you've got the high carbohydrate, the fluids, the sleep sleep. or doing all the right stuff. Yep, absolutely. Yep, that's my that's my general theory when it comes to because I think people always worry if you're talking about recovery and overtraining and fatigue that you're going to be put holding people back. I'm like, no. The idea is that if you look after yourself, you can do more rather than we're going to you know stop you from doing things. Okay, so just again, you see, it's so overtraining. So you think it's it's kind of bandied around because it's funny because yeah. I I just realise how old I am now because these things all come and go. I remember it, it It actually got to the point where when overtraining was all the rage, remember when it was, when they were, mm-hmm. everyone was doing their mm-hmm. salivary cortisols and mm-hmm. things like that and, and all my heart rates up three beats in the morning or down three beats, you know, I'm overtrained. It got to the point that people were saying, oh, athletes are getting soft because they're all in the coaches. Mm-hmm. Everyone was wor- so worried about overtraining mm-hmm. that they were making sure they had all these extra recovery days and things. When you're saying, in fact, that it's actually quite hard to overtrain. And as long as you look after yourself, yourself. you can probably do more almost. Yes. Yep. And overtraining is maybe more about under recovery than overtraining. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, with your recovery research, Mm -hmm. why don't you tell us about that? So you you said you've been looking at ice ice baths and, and various other things. Yeah. So when I first started at the Institute of Sport in Australia, we have a evidence-based culture and where there's all, all these athletes doing ice baths. And part of my job was to, you know, determine is this, should they be doing this? Is this smart? Is this not smart? Um, so we did a, you know, probably, you know, 15 years and we're still doing some research in, in water immersion, ice baths, contrast baths, um, timing of, of recovery and those kinds of things. So the focus was mainly on water immersion. We did a bit of work um, also on on compression um, in addition to obviously the sleep research, but we had a bit of a focus there for quite a few years around um, ice baths and contrast baths and, and hot baths. So what do you find? What do you find with that? Because mm-hmm. it's, it's a funny one because I'm I'm more a me- metabolic guy. Yeah. Yep. And yeah. I'm sort of I've seen bits and pieces about how it might mess up some mm. some adaptations in the muscle and things, yes. but at the same time everyone's doing it. So is it? Mm, yeah. you know and often the athlete, athletes and the coaches actually know before no. the scientists know yes. so what is actually going on there yeah look it's it's probably the most controversial or the hottest topic uh, definitely in recovery but in 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 exercise physiology at the moment is this ice bath and dampening adaptation so very good 
consistent science if you know if you're looking at um, acute performance so you want to back up um, your training or your performance you know if you're racing within 24 to 48 hours a nice bath or some form of water immersion you know cold or contrast is going to be helpful um, done with the right temperatures you know there's enough meta-analyses now and um, studies to show that the data is really good so, you know, short turnaround, if your goal is, you know, within 24 to 48 hours, you want a high quality training session or you want to compete well, an ice bath will help you recover. What the question now has, has you know, has gone in more advanced to is, well, don't we want, you know, inflammation and damage and all these things as part of the recovery mm. and adaptation process? And if we're doing these strategies, aren't we, um, you know, maybe blunting that? And so the research is very much in its early days, um, but from an ice bath, we don't know much about contrast, but from an ice bath perspective, it seems like the times when it may be detrimental is uh, after resistance training, if you're looking at muscle size. Doesn't seem to have mm -hmm. much of an influence on strength, um, but overall muscle size. So if you look at hypertrophy, um, some of the muscle protein synthesis studies, it definitely seems to do something there from a negative perspective. If you look, if you're looking at, um, we did a study in cyclists and given them regular cold water immersion, they got better and better and better. Um, but so the controversies are, but we don't have a lot of good research in athletes at all, um, especially around the resistance training space. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I acutely, we know it, it works. The question is now, if you want big, strong muscles, um, mm. should you be doing ice baths regularly? And if I'm working with, if I was working with a bodybuilder, for example, I'd probably say, I'd probably say no. I'd probably say be very, you know, be very conservative in your ice bath work. If I'm working with a football player, like a rugby player who's getting beat up and has to play every week, um, and getting sore and fatigued over a, a full season. I'd be like, absolutely go for it with your, with your ice baths. And I think that's the nuance that, you know, people don't, you know, when you read a Twitter headline of a, of a study, mm -hmm. so there was one that came out recently about, you know, ice baths don't do anything for, you know, it was cardiovascular, something, something, something. It wasn't performance, but a stack of, of people that work with athletes are tweeting, see, it doesn't work. Like these, this was not in an athletic population. We're not looking for, looking at anything to mm. do with athletes. So I, it's not black and white. I do take a conservative approach with some people because I think it's worth looking at their research that is there. Um, but I also think that we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater because there's a couple of average studies um, in non-athletes training, you know, twice a week. Okay. So, so just to sort of summarize that, I guess, and make sure I've got it right. So you're saying in terms of uh, weight training type strength mm -hmm. training, mm -hmm. it might reduce uh, muscle hypertrophy, but not strength. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, and it may reduce protein synthesis yes. after an acute bout. Yes. Yeah. Which, yep. which fits with yep. that, I guess. Yep. Yeah. But then with endurance, so it's not reducing um, what mitochondrial adaptations so increases mitochondrial volume and doesn't seem not... to and and there hasn't been a lot of like those really good high level me there's been a couple of those really quality mechanistic studies but generally speaking if you extrapolate and you just look at the performance side of things it doesn't seem to you know all the cycling studies there have been no negative effects of regular ice bath exposure Okay, because yeah, that's the thing. What often comes up in the on the podcast is um, you can measure these sort of uh, you might measure the the protein signaling in the muscle, mm -hmm. and you might measure the the protein synthesis over three hours or something, but you don't always look later on what's happened to the growth, right? But you're saying with that actually does, and they don't always fit. What yes. I mean is sometimes you'll see the protein synthesis is reduced, but this growth is normal. But you're yeah. saying it's quite it seems quite, uh, but you did say it probably need more research. Seems to sort of fit with strength, mm -hmm. less protein synthesis, maybe less signaling, mm -hmm. yep. less of an increase in muscle size. But with yep. the endurance, are you getting like no changes in signaling, no changes in VO2 max, no change, changes in 5K performance or whatever, nothing at all? Oh, from, improve in, in from a performance perspective. Oh, sorry, you're getting improvements. improvements. Yes, yes. Okay, now why is that? Do you know? <laughs> I, it's a great question. Um, and, you know, when we when we look at athletes in the real world, what we hear them say is we just feel better. We're more recovered. We can do more in training. 
Um, and so that's the hardest thing is, you know, if you've got athletes that are doing twice a day and they feel a little bit better and they can do a little bit more um, over a long period of time, that adds up. Um, but the, the quality of some of the other mechanistic work yet yeah, is, is not quite there in terms of in some of the, the other studies. That is, it is weird because I guess uh, the, are the strength training people feeling better as well and can do more or do they feel not yeah. as good and can't do as much? <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, if, I think, I don't know about those those particular studies, but if you look at athletes in the real world, especially football players, you know, ice baths are uncomfortable, right? They're not a fun thing to oh. do, but you keep getting, they they are back in there all the time, you know, and, and so they're not going to do that if they don't feel like they're getting benefits from it. I would think, I don't, and I don't think they've been indoctrinated to think that it's something that they absolutely have to do. Um, but I do feel like the athletes aren't good. If they say, and, and I have the odd athlete that says to me, I don't think they do anything for me, ice baths. And I'm like, well, if you've tried it, well, let's find you another recovery strategy. Um, but a lot of them will go back to ice baths. But what I do find interesting is all the research is on ice baths. But my experience in the real world is that if you could give an athlete a choice over the recovery strategy, they'd do contrast. They'd go between hot and cold and they'd keep alternating. Whether the hot makes the cold tolerable or, or exactly what it is, or they feel like they're getting the benefits of the blood flow and the sort of the pumping and the movement of the blood between the hot and the cold water, um, that might be more of what they're experiencing. But in the real world, um, if you've got a recovery facility, facility that has hot and cold, athletes will do hot and cold typically. No, is that because, um, I guess, can you just explain how, how long, how many minutes people do and how cold it is and things? Is it because you don't have to endure the cold, cold for, so for as long because you go cold and then hot? Yes. Or, well, um, yeah, typically most athletes would try to get through a recovery session in 15 to 20 minutes. Like you should be in and out. That should be enough time. Some will do 10 to 15 minutes straight in an ice bath. Like if you've done that enough, you know, 10 to 15 minutes is is tolerable in about 10 to 15 degrees Celsius water. So that's, you know, pretty simple for people to remember. 10 to 15 degrees for 10 to 15 minutes. The mm. contrast tends to be equally about 15 minutes um, starting in the cold, hot, cold, hot, you know, doing one or two minutes each rotation. Athletes tend to like two minutes, two minutes, two minutes, two minutes because they're not getting in and no. out as often. Um, mm -hmm. But keeping the ratios the same, um, you will, you know, if you ever got, jump from hot to cold and you, you, you know, you hop in back in the hot after being in the cold, you'll certainly get tingling feet and hands and, you know, you certainly know the blood flow is being redistributed. You can, you can definitely feel it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, tip, yeah, 15 to 15, 10 to 15 minutes for, for both strategies, I'd say. And, and are you saying that the, the benefits are, are similar from, from, cold versus hot and cold yeah we've done a couple of studies comparing cold and hot cold and it seems to be both effective um maybe the contrast the hot cold is a little bit better after muscle damage where you've got that inflammation and that swelling potentially whereas we tend to target cold after like if you've got if you're an athlete that's in the tour and you, you've got really high core temperatures we don't want to put you in hot water like we want to just cool you down yeah. like just cold so you can be a little bit strategic about how you might use it um but when you think about how being in in cold in water of any form works and you think of the hydrostatic pressure you're going to get that regardless if it's hot or cold you're going to have that hydrostatic um pressure which you know has effects on blood flow um if you're um if you're cold on its own it might help with core temperature a little bit more if you've got contrast it might help with some of the damage and inflammation a little bit more Okay, so what is the? Do you want to just explain the hydrostatic pressure and and what what what's that doing? Yeah, so if if you're a six foot tall person and you're standing in water, um, and you've got your head out, um, and so you've got water up to about your shoulders, you'll have about 150 millimeters of mercury pressure around the ankle. So if you compare that to say compression tights, which may be 15 to 20 millimeters of mercury pressure, um, around at, at the ankle, you've got a, an a really high amount of pressure that's exerted on the periphery when you're in water. Um, and that has a whole lot of um, physiological effects on, on blood flow, on movement of, 
um, of metabolites and, and those kinds of things. So being in, you know, most people experience it. You hop in water, you want to go to the bathroom. There's a redistribution of, of fluid mm. and flow. Um, and so the idea is, you know, the theory is that um, when you're in hydros, when you're in water, it's it's um, and you've got this high hydrostatic pressure. It's good for um, for blood flow and um, and redistribution of, of fluids in, during the recovery period. Not a lot so of research blood, on it, but theory. Yeah, I was just wondering. So the blood flow, you're saying higher <laughs> muscle blood flow or lower hmm. muscle blood flow? Because I don't. always thought if yeah. you want to go to the toilets because the flow goes centrally, so it puts more pressure. Yes. Yeah. They and actually if, have less flow in the muscles, or yes, very yes, potentially. Although it is really early days in in terms of that type of um that type of research, but we know that like if you're in cold water, um for any period of time, that the flow will certainly go centrally to protect the vital organs and protect the core. And then you get out, and especially if you go into hot water, there'll be a redistribution of flow to the um to to the mm. periphery. So um that's what maybe why we see some of those negative effects on hypertrophy is because we've redistributed the blood flow away from the muscle. Okay. Yeah, so it's interesting. It's making me think about, I've had a couple of earlier podcasts um, talking about this idea of if you sprain your ankle, because mm -hmm. you know how you said you have your natural responses. If yes. you sprain your ankle, should you be taking yes. an inflammatory? So this is more talking about anti-inflammatories yeah. mm -hmm. and the timing of it, because you know it's normal to have your inf inflammatory process and then to adapt. And it's the same, I guess, with the cold. I, I'm, I'm yes. still kind of thinking about cold. If you're yes. because part of it, I assume, was to reduce blood flow, mm -hmm. as you said, mm -hmm. because you'll send it more peripheral, uh, centrally and less peripheral, so you yes. don't get too cold. Yes. So you sort of think, hang on, you're reducing the normal responses Response. to to damage, mm. and is that a good thing or a bad thing? A bad but you're thing. saying it, it maybe depends on. Yes. Yeah. And it is interesting because I've spoken to a number of physiotherapists over the years about particularly the use of icing and, and, and cooling and those kinds of things. And, and I think the idea that, you know, a 10 to 15 minute ice bath will reduce all of the inflammatory effects of exercise. I think that's not going to happen. Like I think you're still going to have, and even when you ice, I think you're still going to have an inflammatory response. You know, anti-inflammatory medication may be a different kettle of fish, um, but in terms of water and cooling or icing, I think you're still going to see an inflammatory response. It's just going to be dampened. Um, and maybe that's a good thing or maybe it's it's not a good thing. Um, it, yeah, I think the, the jury is, is a little bit out there, but you still see, you know, I work at the Australian Open every year and um, you still see all the players loaded up with ice bags um, on their sore knees and their shoulders and their ankles. Um, so the staff that are working with them are still prescribing it rightly or wrongly, but um, it's still it's still there. Yeah, it's interesting because I had... Uh... Christian Thorberg on, mm -hmm. and he's mm -hmm. a physiotherapist yep. researcher, mm -hmm. and he was saying the evidence for ice is not really that strong, strong and all this sort of stuff, but it's interesting. But as you say, and we sort of touched on earlier, sometimes it's what the athletes are doing. If, they, if they're feeling it's having an effect, maybe the science might be behind. Behind, yeah, that's it. Mm. exactly right. Yeah. All right, so I want to think uh, a bit more about, I know you've done work on mental fatigue. Mm. And um, recovery, mental recovery, mm -hmm. and, and all sorts of things. I saw you had a global practitioner assessment and management of mental fatigue and mental recovery in high performance sport, a need for evidence based best practice guidelines. Do you want to take us through mm -hmm. what you've been doing there, what you're thinking yeah. about there? Yeah, so this really started through the work. We've got a postdoctoral um, researcher, Susie Russell, who's in our lab. and. I was one of her supervisors for a PhD in the mental fatigue space because we started to see, and you know, Susie was working with netballers, which obviously Australians will know net, netball. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of athletes were saying, "Look, I feel physically recovered, and I feel like I'm okay physically, but it's towards the end of the season. I'm stressed. We've travelled a lot, and I'm mentally exhausted." So we were starting to think, well, we're athletes are saying this, like how we, you know, we probably need to explore it a little bit more. So we started looking at just general, you know, questions around how mentally fatigued are you? And we'd see it would be higher around you know, leading to competition or selection or when, you know, there's a lot of things going on um, that are relevant to, for, you know, important for an athlete. Um, and so then we started thinking about, well, okay, you know, what sort of recovery strategies should you be doing? If athletes are mentally fatigued, what sorts of recovery strategies should they be doing? Um, and there's not a lot out there. 
um, you know, people take mm. caffeine. If you're feeling mentally fatigued, you, you, mm. you take caffeine. And we know that maybe okay. that's not the best thing that you should be doing it maybe for short term, but for your sleep, maybe not. Um, but that practitioner survey was just, you know, Susie led that and she, we just asked, you know, 100, uh, it was over 100, you know, different practitioners working in elite sport. What do they know about mental fatigue? Do they, who looks after it? Who takes care of it? Um, do you induce it? How do you recover from it? Do you think it's important? And basically the the summary of the of the, pa the paper was essentially that we think it's important, but we don't know what to do about it. Um, we don't know how to manage. We don't know how to induce fatigue, at mental fatigue, because maybe you can train it and get better at it. Um, but we also don't really know then, importantly, how to recover from it. Um, so people think it's important, but they just don't know what to do. Okay, because I saw you had, um, I think it was from some tweets that were sent around, uh, you had like a, a table of effective mental recovery on training and effective mental recovery on competition. And you had all these sort of oh, yes. points and things. What what was, yeah. Yeah. So that was really around, um, you know, would you use, you know, would um, how important do you think it is for, for training versus for competition? And, you know, the, the idea is obviously you don't want people, you don't want to induce mental fatigue. You want to make sure they're really recovered from it from a competition perspective. But from a training, maybe it's okay to have a little bit of mental fatigue and induce it and train it and get used to it. Because um, maybe that will help you when you're actually ha ex exposed to it in a competition um, environment. Yeah. So I remember now. I saw I saw you give a talk because before we came started recording, I was saying, "Where did I see?" Because I, I know what it was now. It was Australian Catholic University, and it was um, just before the Melbourne Marathon, I think. And you gave mm -hmm. a talk about inducing mental fatigue and how you do that. Do that. So I remember you were. So why don't you just tell us? I think you had a computer screen, and they had to like keep doing stuff and oh, then you yes, exercise yeah. tested and then you looked at their performance yeah so there's a range of different ways that people can induce mental fatigue and one of the classic ones is the old stroop test you know give someone a you know half an hour of a stroop test and you will exhaust them what's you know, a stroop test again stroop right. test is like when the word is um the word says red but uh, it's colored blue you know oh, it's that's, that's yeah. annoying yeah it's hideous. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's not fun. Um, but yeah, it, um, it, it it's cognitively challenging, right? So that's the way people induce mental fatigue is to to challenge them cognitively, um, and to um, yeah, to to induce the fatigue and then measure different performance things. People tend to measure performance from cognitive fatigue through like a a, a psychomotor like a reaction time task or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, yeah, to look at the effects of the induced fatigue through some sort of test that involves, you know, having to use your brain. Yeah, so I think you were doing, I know you said cognitive things, but I think you were doing that Stroop test or whatever it was, but then you were looking at their, you know, time trial and things like that. Is that, yeah. is that right? Yeah, so mm -hmm. that was one of the studies that we, we did in Canberra, but they were actually with quite good athletes and we found that they were pretty resistant. It was interesting. We didn't see a whole lot of performance effects when the athletes were quite good. So maybe there's something either about what they do and how they train and, and um, you know, what, what they're doing in their training that makes them more resistant. Or maybe you become a good athlete because you're more resistant to, to mental fatigue. We don't, we don't know. But it seems like it's a little bit more challenging in, um, in um, it's, more, it's harder to induce mental fatigue in higher level athletes. So how do, how does it um, compare? I'm just wondering, you know, when you do that sort of acute sort of uh, mental fatigue, you know, doing that stroop test or whatever you call it, the blue and the red, versus the person who's, you know, saying I'm feeling really, you know, mentally tired and you know, yeah. a toddler running around and not yeah. sleeping much or something. How does that compare to then look at their performance? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, we haven't looked a lot at the chronic effects of mental fatigue. Um, but what I think is probably going on in that situation is more around the, um, the lack of sleep that they're getting that might be inducing um, some of the mental fatigue. Because we know you get stressed, you don't sleep as well. Um, and, um, and then you'll get more, you know, daytime fatigue. So um, it's probably, you know, we know there's acute effects, um, but there's probably longer term effects that may have slightly different mechanisms. Okay, great. I think we've covered quite a quite a bit of ground here. Uh, just let me yeah. see if there's one here, John, on Twitter. On recovery, how do you think about recovery in terms of cardiovascular system versus musculoskeletal? E.g. running. Ah, this is the one. Ah, yeah. My training app tells me I'm fully recovered. Yeah, so those yeah. apps and mm. things. Um, mm. 
but my carps beg to differ. <laughs> uh, how do you de- uh, balance the disparity between training load and mechanical load? Yeah. Mm, yeah. So I guess you're, you're, you're apps looking at your sleep and things and saying, yes, you're right to go. And your yeah. calves are like, I don't want to run today. Yes. And that's the, that's one of the real challenges of wearables is you look, they really focus on the sleep and the cardiovascular aspects. So they're really trying to get at readiness through sleep and through heart rate and heart rate variability. Um, so they definitely don't consider that idea of muscle damage, you know, so that's a, mm. you know, how do you, how do you integrate muscle damage into a readiness score? Um, I don't know if you ever can, but it's certainly not done now. So that's why I always take um, these readiness and recovery scores with a real grain of salt. Mm-hmm. And I'm really careful about, you know, when the athletes look at them, I don't really think they're great to to look at some of those scores because we've got no idea how they're calculated. We have a little tiny mm-hmm. idea, but not really. Um, we think there's the, the physiological variables go in there and the sleep and the amount of exercise, but how they're weighted and how that's actually calculated we have absolutely no idea. So I'm always like, take, just see how you feel. Don't, don't pay attention mm-hmm. too much to those, to those scores. Yeah. And, and do they actually, do they, cause you said they take into account your exercise. Do they actually try and work out training load? You know, like, so, so rather than just like what your heart rate is during exercise, your heart rate times, how many minutes you've exercised for and things like that. Yeah. yeah. They'll give you, um, D- depending on which one you use, but you'll you'll certainly get um, energy burn, right? So, <laughs> right, I put oh, okay. quotes there. Um, mm. Energy, so it, you know how much energy you've expended during the day. Um, you'll get mm. obviously time, and you'll get heart rate, um, depending on which which one you use. Um, but a lot of the wearable, a, a, and some of them will give you like a, a. They don't really give you a load score per se. Whoop have something kind of like that, but. Um, it's more depending on which one you which one you use. It's more around looking at the physiological variables overnight, in particular, and incorporating those into your um into the readiness score the next day. Yep, right. Now, Mark uh, sent through a few questions. Should recovery slash deloading be reactive, i.e., wait until you feel overtrained or have an overuse injury? Or proactive, take easy sessions and lifting less, even though you feel you feel okay, or you, you do not feel the need to. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, I it se- to me, it seems logical. Training, yeah, yes. Sorry, mm-hmm. no. That to me just seems like periodizing of training. You know, we know we can't exercise seven days a week. You've got to have, you know, well, you can exercise seven days a week, but you got to have some high, you know, you got to have some lower lower days, some more recovery days. Um, so I think that just fits that just that, that fits to to that kind of model that you periodize and you have you know some days that are harder than others to allow yourself some recovery so you don't mm-hmm. get into a state of excessive fatigue. And I guess you listen to your body. Is that still like that so, that logical sort of old you know? Yeah. Yeah. Is, yeah. is do people still say that, or do coaches sort of say no, no, no? Your body's lying to you. Just keep going, or you know, like. Oh. Is listening to your body still a thing? It seems well, like it should be. Yeah, and I think it is because the, now the, the number of, um, you know, um, rating scales and and um, mon- load monitoring or, or, or um, you know, monitoring apps and things where you put in how do you feel and how did you sleep and how sore are you? So people are asking those questions mm-hmm. on a daily basis. Um, so yeah, I think good. they're I think they're there. Yep, yep, yep. All right. The other thing I know you've done is you've looked at compression garments. Um, mm-hmm. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so we did some work, uh, quite a bit of work looking at compression as a um, as a recovery strategy, sort of looking at it between exercise, um, looking at blood flow, um, looking at performance changes, looking at levels of compression. So essentially, you know, the best way to sort of summarise the compression research is to is to say that yes, we think it influences blood flow. It influences soreness and perception of recovery. So it's probably having an effect on, you know, inflammation um, or, or some, some damage effects. Um, there's some benefits to performance, but it's hit and miss depending on the studies and, and kind of how you, how you measure it. Um, but it's one of those things that it's probably, you know, a relatively easy practical choice for people to use compression and there's likely going to be no negative effects. So maybe small effects on how you feel, small effects on blood flow and soreness and maybe performance depending on what you're doing, but 
highly unlikely to have a negative influence on any aspects of recovery um, or performance. So again, is this sort of like the hydrostatic pressures you're talking about with in the water? So you just have a little bit of pressure yes. and it's it's what, increasing blood flow? Or yes, yeah. So the idea is, you know, the theory behind medical compression, which is where a lot of, you know, recovery strategies come from. They come from the medical world, you know, icing, compression, et cetera. Bring it in mm -hmm. and think it should work with athletes. Um, but the theory is that it, it um, compression, it compresses the smaller, more peripheral vessels to force the blood through to the, the deeper vessels um, to enhance, you know, venous return and all those kinds of things. So, um, and there's there's research done to to support the fact that it that it does that that it's changing blood flow in a positive way. Okay, and it and it does actually increase venous return. Has mm -hmm. that been shown? Mm -hmm. oh. Yep. Okay. Yep, been some, I guess it's yeah. small. You're saying these are small. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yep. Small. And this is using it during the exercise. No, this is purely from a recovery point of view. Oh, for the recovery. A, from a recovery, yeah. yeah. So during exercise, it's probably, you know, blood flow is probably high enough as it is, right? Mm. You're probably not going to influence it much with compression. Well, that's what I always thought. Mm. Yeah. But what we think maybe the, some of the benefits from compression is that muscle oscillation. So, you know, you, you wear, if you're wearing really tight compression and you're jumping, you're probably less likely. And there's a couple of studies to show that there's – athletes call it muscle wobble right you're getting less muscle oscillation and muscle movement and that maybe that relates to less damage and maybe it relates to better proprioception and there's a couple of studies out there to, to support that for the work during exercise um, for the benefits during exercise the benefits post exercise um, are more likely to be due to, to blood flow and the compressive effects and the, the reduction in inflammation and swelling i'll just tell people quickly what pro proprioception is Oh, just because oh, you mentioned it, I, just I know, know, knowing I, where you, yeah, oh, really, just knowing where you are in space, in space, right? Isn't that? that's exactly the way exactly. I describe it. Knowing where you are in space, yeah. All right, cool. Um, now, sex. I, I often like to think about are there sex differences? So, I guess I don't know across sleep, recovery, fatigue, all of these things. Mm -hmm. um, I, I saw you had some papers on you know, sleep and recovery education to promote female health and performance, etc. Yeah, from a recovery perspective, when you're looking at things like water immersion, we've just finished one study that showed no differences um, in males and females. However, there, there is and there has been some work done to say there is um, that females may experience poorer sleep over different phases of the menstrual cycle. It's very early um, and it may not be in all, obviously, all female athletes, but two take-homes from it is it's the poor sleep is probably related to symptoms, right? So obviously you've got, you know, bloating or pain or, you know, whatever you've got, then that's probably going to influence sleep. Um, but we think, and what we hear anecdotally from athletes is that those, um, the female athletes that um, have menstrual cycle dysfunction, so where they've got a lot of pain or a lot of bleeding or what it may, you know, they are the ones that are also likely to have, to have sleep issues. Okay, that makes sense. All right, well, thanks a lot for coming on. What I like to do at the end is um, is to have a bit of a takeaway message, is a bit of a mm -hmm. summation of what we've talked about. What what you know, what mm -hmm. you want people to take away from this. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, it's great. Oh, good, I should have thought about this in advance. Um, look, I think that to you know a bit of a scientific cop out, but look at individual look at yourself as an individual and what works for you because a lot of the recovery strategies are as i say early days but there's some fundamentals and some foundations that you should not um you know avoid so good sleep and good nutrition absolutely and then if you've got those then you can think about you know some of the the other you know physical recovery strategies like you know water immersion compression etc so um the foundations are try to get your sleep mm -hmm. and your nutrition as as good as possible actually one thing i meant to ask just quickly is is you know how you said the compression is quite quite small probably the effects and mm -hmm. the and then the cold uh immersion and the uh, contrast you know the athletes like it they think it works is part of this placebo because i know i know mm -hmm. i've thought about altitude training and talked to people about altitude training and at one stage, someone who's a big researcher in the field said, I don't actually think it makes a lot of difference, but the athletes like it. And if it's a placebo, great, we'll take right. that. Yeah. Is, is there is there much to that, do you think? Or? 
yeah, absolutely. The challenge is from a, you know, you can't placebo for an ice bath. You know, you can't really placebo for compression because you know if you've got it or not. But what we tend to do is ask people, do they believe in it or not? Um, And Mm. we did a compression study where we found that compression benefited performance, repeat performance. Um, So we did, um, it was a running cycling task, compression cycling task. They performed better in the second cycling task. But what we found Mm. was that those who believed in compression improved more than those that didn't. So Mm. we tend to ask around belief a little bit more in recovery because it's hard to to Mm. placebo. Um, but yes, I think belief is powerful and why not use it? You know, if an athlete believes exactly. in it and it's not harmful, let's go for it. Have you done the same with the, the ice and the contrast? Have you no. asked people, do you believe in it or? We haven't hmm. done that yet. That would be a fun one to do. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thanks again for coming on. Yeah, Go no on problem. And, thanks. Uh, it's great to chat. I might see you back in Melbourne. I'll be back in a month yeah. or so. Okay. Yeah, a see you. <laughs> Thanks, it will be warmer. Okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Bye-bye. See Bye. See ya. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Please like, subscribe, pass it on to your friends and colleagues. Check out the other podcasts. Thanks again.